hello everyone and welcome to our next card review in our Witchwood card review series. We're going to be doing Paladin now. Um, and we're going to be rating the cards on a 1 to 5 scale where 1 is trash cards like Magma Rager, 2 is tech cards like Black Knight, 3 is um, some staple or, uh, sorry, some playable uh, or cards that are kind of uh, part of a, a niche archetype like Deadly Shot or Play to Beetle. Um, four are cards that are like deck defining or um, staples across multiple uh, decks in a class like Wandering Monster or Gadgets and Auctioneer. And five are your real meta defining cards like Call to Arms that alter the way not only all the decks within that class choose to build themselves, but also how decks outside of that class um, or the decks that use those cards to choose to build themselves. So, you know, cards like Call to Arms and uh, Void Lords. So. For Paladin, we have the Glass Knight first. Uh, the Glass Knight is a 4 mana 4 3 legendary minion with Divine Shield, and whenever you restore health, gain Divine Shield. So, uh, obviously, the potential on this card is quite high, um, but it is actually a little bit like a Silver Moon Guardian with uh, one extra attack to start off with, and that's not a card that's really ever seen competitive play. Do you think that Glass Knight's uh, upside, you know, different and its extra attack point kind of differentiates it enough to make uh, it good? I really do. Uh, I think when I first saw the card, I thought it was really powerful. Um, even for me, even without the the ability to the second part of the text, I still think the card would be good. A four mana four three divine shield, I think is quite a solid minion. I don't know if it would be good enough to be legendary, but I think it's definitely solid. And then. The fact that it has the, that extra, the, the second line, I think makes the card, you know, really powerful. Yeah, the extra <laughs> attack point definitely is relevant. Um, personally, I think that in order for the card to be really powerful, I think you need to be able to uh, reliably restore health. And one problem with that is at the moment, the Paladin decks are generally the more aggressive ones, so I don't actually tend to take much damage. And in order for this effect to work, you actually have to restore health. I'm pretty sure you, know, you can't just like heal yourself uh, for, you know, you, you can't have a card like Benevolent Gin if you don't have any damage. If you're not damaged at all, it's not going to heal you. Um, so that can be a bit of an issue with Glass Knight. <laughs> um, the best card to kind of activate it is really True Silver Champion. Uh, that's kind of the, the standout card that, that works well with it. The problem being they're both in the four mana slot, which is a very contested mana slot in Paladin, especially with Call to Arms around. So I'm a little bit skeptical about Glass Knight. I do think it could have a lot of potential in the future, but right now I think it might just be, you know, kind of playable or it might find its way into a deck that actually wants to heal a little bit more, which is definitely going to be a more of a, a niche Paladin deck, I think. So I'm going to give it a three, although... I definitely do agree. It ha it certainly has potential. Yeah, I think uh, my rating I think is a four. Yeah. I think it's definitely one of my one of the one of the legendaries I'm a little bit more excited to see. Okay, um, and and uh, speaking of legendaries, I'm sure you're super excited to see. Next up, we have uh, Prince Liam. Prince Liam is a five mana five five legendary minion with battle cry transform transform all one cost cards in your deck into legendary minions. So, uh, that little minions tag at the end is actually kind of important because it means you don't get any of the legendary weapons and you don't get any death knights. <laughs> Not getting death knights is definitely worse than, a, let's say, a random legendary card. Um, but uh, Prince Liam, I mean, the idea here is probably to synergize with secrets and if you have a kind of low curve deck, it can give you some value later in the game. Uh, problem being, random legendaries, not all that hot. Yeah, random legendaries... You know, as we've said before, uh, you know, it's very, what's, uh, they're very high variants. You know, there's some very good ones, then there are some very poor ones. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, I think the other problem is you actually have to draw them. And if you draw a poor legendary or a bad one, it's like missing a draw step, which is a yep. very punishing cost. Uh, so that's really the big issue for me with Prince Liam. And even though Prince Liam himself is well statted, I'm not sure there's any deck out there that really runs enough one cost cards for this effect to even be that worthwhile. Uh, and if you're running a lot of one cost cards, you probably want to run a card like Divine Favor, and then you don't want those one cost cards to turn into random legendaries because then your Divine Favor is going to be harder to get off. So overall, I just am not a big fan of the, the Prince Liam effect. Um, and I think I'm going to give Prince Liam a two. I also give it a two. Just to sort of note, is 
it's they're obviously trying to try and promote some sort of using your secrets and then the whole idea is once you've gotten some of your secrets out then you play prince dm i'm not yeah. completely sold on it either i mean they were talking about on stream about you know oh you know aggro sometimes needs tools to close up the game and i'm just thinking but random legendaries are probably not the best way of closing out the yeah. game Aggro closes out the game by playing a lot of one drops, playing divine favor, and playing a lot more one drops. And, and playing aggressive, uh, playing ag like aggressive minions or yeah. like buffs, right? Yeah. And I don't foresee random legendaries fulfilling any of those roles most of the time. Yeah. I mean, outside of getting something like King Crush or Leroy, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so next up, we have Cathedral Gargoyle, uh, a much hyped Paladin card. It's a two mana two two with. Uh, it's an epic. And it has battle cry. If you're holding a dragon, gain taunt and divine shield. So if you meet the condition, this is a better shielded mini bot, one of the most powerful two drops ever for Paladin. Uh, doesn't have the mech tag, I suppose. So that's one other downside. Um, but it has would have divine shield as well as sorry, it would have taunt as well as the divine shield. Uh, the only big problem is the condition. And uh, looking at the dragons available to us now that we have all the cards it's kind of difficult to justify a spot for cathedral gargoyle in a, in a paladin deck i think yeah i really wanted to make it work so like i will still give it a four because i still believe that if and when the dragons become available it will be a critical it will be a very key part of making a dragon paladin work yeah but yeah like you say right now you, you, you basically paladin doesn't have any uh paladin, uh class there's no class dragons in paladin yeah. Uh, so it's simply there's the neutral ones. And the neutral ones, there aren't any ones that, you know, really draw you to wanting to run them. A lot mm. of them you kind of have to go, which one am I okay running? Mm. Uh, and also the big problem is sort of the default dragon of a Twilight Drake. The problem in Paladin is, as we've mentioned before, that four, that four mana slot is highly congested. Yeah. So that's yeah. quite a big problem. Yeah, so, I mean, I definitely agree that in the future, if there is a viable Dragon Paladin deck, then Cathedral Gargoyle would definitely be a 4 or possibly... Uh, actually, I would say it is ever really going to be a 5, unless the meta is very kind of tempo-based uh, as well. But I definitely agree it could be a 4 in the future. But for now, I'm going to give it a 3, uh, almost leading to a 2 uh, in the immediate future, because we don't really have a lot of the, the Paladin the dragon synergy available but i do think that it could uh, be part of a, a niche archetype at the moment in in paladin uh, and that's kind of why i'm going to give it a three um next up we have hidden wisdom hidden wisdom is the uh, new paladin secret it is uh, an epic and it's one mana as all the paladin secrets are it reads after your opponent plays three cards in a turn draw two cards so we've seen a similar kind of uh trigger on um, Rat Trap in Hunter. We spoke about it there a lot, how it's a, quite a difficult trigger to actually activate, and when it activates is largely gonna be up to your opponent. It's quite an easy secret to play around in, in most decks, and it's only really gonna be useful as a tech against very specific decks. So, you know, I mean, that was largely what we said about Rat Trap. Uh, do you think uh, it's pretty much the same with Hidden Wisdom? Yeah, uh, for me, it's a, it's a two very niche application almost never gonna put it off it's gonna be what's it, see, it reminds me a bit of like sacred trial yeah. you know one of those like random it's probably just gonna sit there and then the only hope you have is that your your opponent forgets at some point you know what secrets they've played around and randomly triggers it right <laughs> yeah like, like, and, like literally and i think the big issue for me is that um, whilst it is a kind of a tech card in those scenarios, I don't think in those scenarios you drawing two cards is actually going to be anywhere near good enough. So I think it's only really going to see playoff Hydrologist. Uh, and I actually think it's a trash card. Like, I, I don't think Hidden Wisdom's um, reward for them procking it uh, or the cost of the, for them for procking it is actually really that impactful. Um, because when your opponent can kind of control your draw, they can also mess with you and make you overdraw and stuff like that. So I, I just, I don't, I don't think Hidden Wisdom is, is a good card at all. I don't even see it as a good tech card, to be quite honest. Yeah, I give it, uh, I mean, I give it a two because I, like, maybe there's some potential fringy tech value. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Um, next up we have Silver Sword. 
Silver Sword is an 8 mana 3 4 rare uh, weapon for Paladin. After your hero attacks, give your minions plus 1 plus 1. Uh, so, you know, these kind of board effects that will buff all your minions are obviously quite powerful. Uh, the big question here is, you know, with Vine Cleaver in standard uh, at the moment, is Silver Sword really going to contest with it? And whilst the effect is better if you do already have the board, very often in the situations where Vine Cleaver comes down, you've generally lost the board and are trying to find a way back onto the board. And uh, for that reason, I think Vine Cleaver will just keep pushing Silver Sword out for the foreseeable future. Yeah, for me, Silver Sword as an 8 drop feels a bit too low impact. The fact that it's only a 3 attack weapon, I mean, the fact that, let's say, the, the buff, for the buff to be relevant, you need to have quite a wide board, which generally means that if you're having a wide board on turn 7, you're probably in a pretty good position anyway. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, you're, if, if your board is wide enough and hasn't been dealt with by AOEs on turn 7, like turn 8, so, yeah, I think Vine Cleaver will still take his place every day of the week. I mean, maybe there's some fringe uh, scenario where you run like Vine Cleaver and a, uh, and uh, Silver Sword. I mean, arguably so, Vine Cleaver sets up for it, but yeah, uh, that's, that's so, taking a little bit too long, in my opinion. So, I'll, that's why I rated it two, but like on the lower side of two. You know, like the effect is powerful, but I don't know if it's eight mana powerful, right? Yeah, I think at. As you said, at 3 attack for an 8-mana weapon, I just don't think it's particularly good at all. And it's pretty much going to have to just go face at that stage, or uh, you're going to have to be in a very commanding position already. Uh, and I, I, I think um, Silver Sword is a 1, personally. Uh, although, you know, it does have those... It does have a lot of value when it works, I just don't think it's going to work reliably enough. Uh, and next up, we have Bellringer Sentry. Bellringer Sentry is a 4 mana 3 4 rare minion with battle cry and death rattle. Put a secret from your deck uh, into the battlefield. So, uh, a little bit uh, reminiscent of Mysterious Challenger. The big difference here being that it only puts one secret at a time. And one of the best things about Mysterious Challenger was that the secrets synergized with each other. Uh, and the other one important thing to remember for those that have Mysterious Challenger PTSD is that there's no. Uh, avenge anymore in the, yeah, that's, the secret that's pool that's really powerful actually yeah and that, that was one of the secrets that synergized so well with redemption and uh, noble sacrifice in particular so now just with redemption and noble sacrifice i think is probably the two decent secrets getaway kodo is rotating as well uh, i mean i realized that, i just realized this now and i was like i thought it was stone standard uh, yeah <laughs> i i just I don't think you want to underpay for a 3-4 on turn 4 in, in Paladin. And once again, coming back to Paladin's 4 slot, uh, there's so many other options. And to be frank, they all seem better. I'd rather have uh, Glass Knight. I'd rather play Colt Arms. I'd rather play True Silver Champion. Hell, I'd even rather play Twilight Drake in uh, those kind of decks where I'm looking for that Dragon Synergy. So <laughs> for me, I just... Bell Ring a Sentry... I, I, there's definitely some, some deck maybe in the future if they keep printing stuff that synergizes with secrets, but for now, I, it's just a one for me. Yeah, uh, also, not sold on it. I can't remember. I think I gave it also... Uh, I think you gave it I a gave two. it a two yeah. because of its, like, its fringe. Maybe maybe this is sleep of the deck. I don't see it, but, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's still... I mean, because the idea is getting two cards out of your deck is a, is a potentially powerful effect. The fact that those two cards aren't that good, ugh, yeah, the torn. Yeah. Um, and next up we have Paragon of Light. Paragon of Light is a three mana, two, four rare minion with while this minion has three or more attack. It has taunt and lifesteal. Uh, so you need to find a way to buff up its attack. Uh, some of the ways are kind of like uh, adaptation if you get plus one attack or plus three, at uh, sorry, plus one plus one or plus three attack. Uh, having it next to a direwolf alpha, buffing it up with blessing of might, you know, or um, sound the bells, a card we'll get to later. Or, oh, sorry, um, by the way, it's a two strength. five, not two four, hey? Oh, sorry, uh, did I say two four? It is, <laughs> it is showing as a two five at least. So, yeah, so three mana two five, um, which is a pretty resilient body, but it needs to find a buff to really make the best use of it, right? To get that yeah. taunt and lifesteal, which is ideally what you want although 
I always find Taunt and Lifesteal quite a weird combo uh, because the one is protecting your health total and the other is kind of um, replenishing it. And if you're playing this on curve, you probably only need one or the other. Most of the time, you probably just rather have Taunt rather than Lifesteal. So I think yeah. the Lifesteal is going to be a little bit ineffectual sometimes. You know, that issue we mentioned with um, <coughs> uh, Glass Knight and, you know, not actually having taken damage yet. Um, this obviously does synergize well with the Glass Knight if you can actually buff it up. So, I mean, that that's the real question uh, here. Well, with this Paragon intimidation Flight. of Kings is quite appealing, right? Yeah. I mean, like, as against Aggro, for example, a, a 3 mana 2 5 is pretty decent against Aggro. And then if you play Blessing of Kings on it, all of a sudden you've got a, a 6 9 taunt love steal. Yeah. Which feels pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that is definitely an option for maybe like a more mid-range paladin, or uh, yeah, maybe it can even find its way into some kind of uh, buff paladin. But it, it definitely does have quite a resilient body naturally, and it benefits well from being uh, buffed or even just standing next to a direwolf alpha. Um, which I must say, the direwolf alpha synergy is very good because you this actually then protects the direwolf alpha with its taunt. Uh, and that kind of yeah. keeps it, 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 it buffed. Uh, so I think that, that synergy works very well as well. Um, yeah, so for me, I give this a 3. I think it's quite a solid card. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm i not really sure I, I see the, the application for it now, but I definitely do think uh, it could see play in, in a few Paladin decks as the 3 slot is definitely losing uh, a big option in Rallying Blade at the moment. And maybe this can help... Uh, uh, you know, provide some kind of decent board. So, yeah, I, I'd agree with a 3 for Paragon of Light. Um, next up, we have Ghostly Charger. Ghostly Charger is a 5-mana, 3-4 common beast uh, with Divine Shield and Rush. So, I know you're a fan of Ghostly Charger. Do you want to tell us why? So, the fact that, I mean, as a 5-mana, a, a mana three, the fact that it has Rush and Divine Shield means it can, you know, get some quite powerful tra i think it can get some quite powerful trades um you know it can get it so uh, the, the thing is that when i think about it is on five three attacks not that relevant but like you generally can't combine it with something that's in play already so you know to get a good trade and then you still have a three four body which i think is pretty decent sure so all right i think it's just kind of just a versatile body then obviously it synergizes as well with you know cards like countess that you know, can fetch, you know, a rush minion from your deck. Yeah, Countess Ashmore is, I think, the one big thing that Ghostly Charger has going for it, in that it's one of the, the better rush cards for Paladin. Yeah. Uh, and if a Paladin deck wants to play Countess Ashmore for that, uh, you know, card draw and value in the in the late game, I think it works quite well. And obviously, there's already existing synergy with uh, Death Rattle in particular, with Tyrion for... Um, Countess, so I think that's the one big thing that I like about Ghosty Charger. I think the three damage on turn five is a bit weak, um, but you know we've seen these kind of cards like uh, Argent Horse Rider before be pretty decent. And uh, when you generally have this kind of rush uh, or charge and divine shield, um, it generally works quite well in in combination. So I definitely think Ghosty Charger could be decent, but for me, what's really hampering it is just the the three attack on turn five you know if it was a four three i think it would be much better so for me i'm just going to be giving it a three yeah for me i give it a four i think it, i think it is really powerful uh next up we have rebuke a very often talked about and quite hyped card uh, rebuke is a two mana common spell enemy spells cost five more next turn so what's often termed the lotheb effect um, this is the first time we've seen it um, on any other anything other than Lotheb. Uh, the big difference here is it's not coming with a 5-5 five, five body and you kind of just have to put this spell in your deck, uh, which is somewhat situational in its use. You, you kind of want to find um, a really good use for Rebuke. And uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm not finding a very good uh, use for it right now, at least when, when, I was, when we were you know, looking at building some decks. Yeah, for me... <coughs> Because I think it's you know it's a very sort of tech a, a tech oriented card uh, like a sort of a tech oriented card. I give it a, a two, you know, fringe tech applications. The and the reason why it's, it's obviously no Lothip is you know Lothip at other times you still wouldn't mind playing a five and a five five. Yeah. Uh, to gain a tempo, but unfortunately just playing a two mana spell that just adds the add, increases the cost for one to doesn't quite 
give you that tempo, right? Yeah, I think I think it's very important that the, the rebuke is a spell you have to put in your deck and doesn't come with any kind of body. I, I think it's definitely um, a punishing aspect of this card. Uh, you know, it's putting a whole card in your deck just to shut down some of your opponent's options. Uh, you need to have something really powerful that you want to do with that, and <coughs> there isn't really a great combo at the moment. The best might be with the um, Uther of the Ebon Blade, uh, but even that kind of scenario is, is somewhat fringe, I think. So... For me, uh, I would kind of give Rebuka Rebu 2 because, as you mentioned, it, it is basically a tech card at this point. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Sound the Bells. Sound the Bells is the Echo spell for Paladin. It's a two-mana common spell with Echo. Give a minion plus one, plus two. So basically Divine Strength with uh, plus Echo. And uh, like a lot of the other kind of echo spells it's essentially got one mana added to its um cost for the uh upside of having echo uh so you know on four mana you can kind of buff two minions uh and comparing it to something like blessing of kings it's, it's kind of plus two plus four which obviously is a lot weaker but the big thing i like about sound the bells is that you can you know if, if you're playing a deck that has a wide board you can choose to buff multiple minions and make lots of good value trades and that's the one thing i do like about sound the bells yeah the fact that you can spread the stats is obviously like an advantage but i just feel that you know spending two mana repeatedly in a turn just to get plus one plus two i think might be a bit too low tempo yeah and i think most of the time you're probably still better off playing either blessing of kings or sparky steed yeah, sure. So those are kind of the two main buff cards that I see still being better most of the time. Yeah, Sound the Bells. Uh, I think it's uh, a three. I think that it's actually going to be decent for some like niche decks. We'll get to one of the decks just now, which I'm not sure it's going to be that good a deck, but uh, for something like Buff Paladin, um, you know, with the quest, uh, this is a good way of kind of achieving the quest because you get... Um, multiple spells towards completing the quest in a single card um, because of the <clears throat> the echo um, and i think for those kind of paladin decks in, in many situations it might be better than something like blessing of kings because it can keep more of your minions alive uh, as well for some of those decks so i think sound the bells could be pretty decent i, I really like its versatility Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm not a believer in it. I think uh, my rating, what what did I give it? I think I gave it... Uh, a two, I believe. Yeah, I think I gave it a two. Like, I think, it, you know, it might have some fringe, once again, sort of like, maybe in the deck, uh, in the uh, quest deck, like the, the quest pattern deck, but uh, all around, I'm not too hot. To, I don't think the card is that, that good, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, okay, so speaking of Paladin decks, let's have a look at some of the ones we've been uh, theory crafting. Uh, honestly, I think Paladin is a bit of a tricky one to theory craft. Uh, when we look at some of the, the decks that are going to struggle going forward, Murloc Paladin is losing Valfin Inquisitor, which is quite a massive uh, loss, not being able to get the Murlocs from your hero power, as well as just a 1 mana 1 3 is a, a bit of an issue. So there's probably maybe going to be a Murloc Paladin, but we didn't want to look at pretty much an existing archetype and how it'll change. So we've looked at kind of a slightly newer you know takes on uh, maybe some decks that were tried before uh, in this case we've got mid-range paladin um, so what are some of the the features of this mid-range paladin what are some of the the new cards that have found their way into this pandemonium so this for, uh, so this was kind of a blend of new cards combined with you know flashback to older mid-range so those who've been playing for a long time will recognize cards uh, uh, like old or peacekeeper lay on hands and Tyrion. Then some of the new cards that I've, uh, you know, found a way, Countess Ashmore, uh, you know, I, I think the card is absolutely amazing. I love the card. Um, other, other new cards, the one we just spoke, the cards we just spoke about, Paragon of Light, uh, Glass Knight, Ghostly Charger, as well as the Rotten Apple Bomb. So these are all sort of like, you know, like the, you know, the, the Rotten Apple Bomb, you know, the 5 mana 4, 5 torn, Death Row Restore 4 health, yeah. It has the dual synergy of protecting, you know, of being a taunt as well as restoring health. So that synergizes a little bit with your Glass Knight. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, oh, we, of course, you know, I'm running Court to Arms, which uh, can pull your, you know, Righteous Protector, Argent Squire, Dove Alpha, the Jugglers, or the Loot Hoarder. 
and yeah. the loot holder kind of provides an extra you know card draw option from call to arms because you have so yeah. many of these other kind of powerful cards in your deck that you also want to find yeah so i mean this deck it's got elements of you know what the current did it in but you can see you know it's a lot more focused on the mid to late game you know with power cards like lay on hands and Tyrion, yeah. as well as uh countess so yeah. that's why i've also you know i've run a one equality as well the double consecration in terms of being able to stabilize against uh, you know more early aggressive decks yeah it's definitely a, a deck that has a, a lot of value packed into it a lot of yep. ways to kind of refill its hand with countess lay on hands uh, the loot orders and obviously um you know call to arms kind of refills the board directly so uh it definitely is a lot more along that like classic lines of the the mid-range paladin um and obviously has that true silver champion glass knights kind of synergy you spoke about so i'm not so sold on on mid-range paladin actually being great for good like win conditions uh that's that's the big issue i have with it uh i think the deck might kind of struggle to win games against some of the the decks that have much better value engines in the late game um so i mean that that's the the large issue i have there but uh it could be a deck in you know if you that could find its place in the, in the right meta but overall I, I, honestly i'm not that positive about uh, mid-range paladin or optimistic let's say about mid-range paladin specifically yeah well, well i mean we'll see right <laughs> yep uh and next we have a deck that uh is clearly far superior uh <laughs> at, at least in its meme value and that is once again a return to the quest paladin deck so uh deck built around last collider saw and um some buff cards um we've got you know quite a few buffs in here probably more than we actually need to be quite honest because of sound the bells uh we've got you know adaptation and personal heroism existing ones in there uh, alongside uh, sound the bells and um spike bridge steed uh sound the bells i think is a really good way to to kind of get towards completing the quest we've even managed to kind of uh, fit in one rebuke here as a way to kind of protect our board so that we can get off those good uh, sound the bells turns and the following turns or just you know generally find ways to to buff our board uh, and then of course we got lanessa to make uh, extra value use of all those um buffs uh paragon of light which synergizes well with uh, sound the bells and then we've also got marsh drake in here partly because we wanted an extra dragon for the cathedral gargoyle um, which, although it's obviously not anywhere near as good when you pull it from call to arms, uh, because it's just a 2-2 two -two with no Divine Shield and Taunt, uh, I think it's still decent. And uh, with the Marsh Drake, you can kind of curve out cleanly and, and you can kind of use the Divine Shield on the Gargoyle to kill the 2-1 Poisonous that the, the Marsh Drake gives. Um, so there's a little bit of synergy there, as well as maybe using some of the, the one drops uh, with Divine Shield or so, something like that to find a way to kill the the poisonous um drake uh, i ultimately i'm not sure paladin's the best home for marsh drake uh but honestly with only otherwise really cobalt scale being 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 the only other dragon in the deck it, it kind of um suffers a little bit from not having enough dragons to activate cathedral gargoyle which is largely the thing we've spoken about with cathedral gargoyle uh and then finally there's also a vicious uh scale hide two mana uh one three with uh, russian lifesteal I think getting Rush off uh, Call to Arms can be kind of powerful, um, especially if you can find a way to, to kind of buff it. Um, and we also have, like, one of Pandemonium's favorite cards, Nat Paggle, in the deck, uh, as uh, it's at least a healthy minion to pull with the Call to Arms. To a look... healthy minion, I see how that... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to, to look towards buffing in the, in the following turns. So, ultimately, I, I think this deck's probably even worse than the Midrange Paladin, uh, but it was an, an interesting exercise in looking at whether it's at the like best possible use of sound the bells in in a in, like a deck built around uh, relying on, on on you know buffing minions uh, a lot. So I, I'm not really sold on this, and overall I'm actually not feeling too positive about uh, Paladin going forward. They're losing the OTK Paladin deck they've had as well because of the rotation of uh, Auction Master Beardo. Um, and maybe we could see a control paladin shell once again i think one of the issues with control paladin is uh, win conditions and they're also losing uh, in zoth which you know obviously synergized so well with Tyrion. Uh, and as you already mentioned the um Valfin inquisitor so i'm a little bit skeptical on paladin going forward uh, i think they can definitely probably find a way to make an aggro deck work purely on the back of the power of call to arms 
Um, mm-hmm. And oh, oh, Paladin's also losing stand against Darkness. Uh, we didn't really look at the Duded Index. I think there's probably still one that is possible to build because there's other ways to generate uh, dudes. Um, but we, you know, we wanted to focus more on these uh, newer cards. So I think those kind of uh, you know aggro uh, kind of Paladin decks and maybe Duded and might be the 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 major hopes for Paladin going forward. Yeah, I mean, probably, I mean, Call to Arms, probably still a good card. Ego, Paladin, probably still going to be a dick. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, Call to Arms is, once again, really the, the savior for Paladin. I mean, pretty much the reason Paladin's good right now anyway. Um, so that that might be the one card that can keep uh, Paladin in a, a decent spot in the meta. But overall, um, I, I don't think Paladin's going to be able to keep up with the, the power level of some of the... Uh, other decks and you know unless we've completely missed some archetypes here or if dude paladin still remains uh solid enough so yeah overall that's that's all i really have for paladin uh you can find us on twitter uh you can find pandemonia at pandemonia ZA, myself at dev underscore gaming and we'll be back with more of these videos so please like subscribe and follow uh and feel free to share the videos as much as possible and also uh you know welcome any comments so feel free to leave those and until the next one Cheerio. Cheers.